Today I rise to honor the heritage, culture, and immense and amazing contributions of Latinos to the United States by introducing a bicameral resolution recognizing September 15th through October 15th as Hispanic Heritage Month. When you walk into my office, both in my Washington DC office and the San Fernando Valley office where I represent, you will notice a very important picture of two hardworking gentlemen, two generations of Mexican immigrants, my father and my mother's father, smiling while crouching down picking potatoes in the very hot Stockton, California sun. No matter how exhausted, how busy, and how much pain they endured, they never complained. And they took the time to pause and smile because they were so proud to be able to do a hard day's work, an honest day's work right here in the United States of America. That same grit and positivity that they demonstrated in that photo are values carried by Latinos throughout our country's history. Farm workers, astronauts, scientists, many amazing contributors to our great country. Latinos who've helped keep our country operating before the pandemic, through the pandemic, and still to this day. And it's those same values and stories, those of individuals, many of them immigrants, who encompass an unwavering spirit of perseverance. These are the true stories that will be told at the National Museum of the American Latino. Latinos have been in what is now the United States for hundreds of years. So that current and future generations have the opportunity to visit the National Mall and experience our beautiful history, culture, and contributions that make us the greatest nation in the world. Yes, that's right, ladies and gentlemen, the beautiful National Mall will soon have a Latino Museum on it so that people from all over the world can appreciate the amazing contributions that Latinos have been making to this great country and this continent for hundreds and hundreds of years. Hi, I'm Zach, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Craig and Pam. In the opening clip, you heard California Representative Tony Cardenas talk about his family's experience as Mexican immigrants. In his comments, Representative Cardenas references the, quote, heritage, culture, and amazing contributions of American Latinos and the, quote, grit and positivity that his own ancestors and countless Hispanic Americans have and continue to showcase. In this episode, we'll pause and smile, as Representative Cardenas mentioned, as we consider the perseverance and pride of America's Latinos and Latinas during this Hispanic Heritage Month. The month, a holiday that was first celebrated in 1968 as a week-long celebration, now encompasses many other celebrations, including the independence of Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Mexico, and Chile, as well as the celebration of Virgin Islands Puerto Rico Friendship Day. After the commercial break, we'll have a conversation with special guest Jorge Zamanillo, founding director of the National Museum of the American Latino, as we talk with him about the history of Hispanic Heritage Month, key moments and stories from throughout our country's story, the development of the Smithsonian's newest museum, and what teachers across the country can do to recognize and celebrate our Latino and Latina neighbors. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. So joining us today is Jorge Zamanillo, director of the National Museum of the American Latino. Jorge, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and your role at the Smithsonian Institution? Sure. Again, my name is Jorge Zamanillo, museum director and the founding director uh, for the new National Museum of the American Latino which was just passed by Congress in December 2020. Uh, my background is in uh, museum work. I was an, actually an archaeologist for about 10 years, and then I was a museum director and a curator in, in various positions in Miami before heading to D.C. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about how the idea for the National Museum of the American Latino came about? Sure. Uh, well, this has been in the making for over 25, 30 years, back in the 90s. Um, group of individuals wanted to make sure that Latinos and Latino history and culture were represented at the national level and that our stories would, would be represented on a national museum in D.C. Uh, so it started exploring that possibility, and it's taken years uh, just pushing for it and advocating for that. Um, and finally, you know, years later, 
after a study was conducted uh, and a report was produced called Willful Neglect. And it was an assessment of, of, of Smithsonian Museums to check in uh, on what kind of representation, what stories were being told within all these museums that represented Latino culture. Um, and sadly, uh, not much was being done. Uh, so using that report and that um, that effort, you know, they kept on pushing for it. And finally, it took many years, but in December uh, 2020, uh, legislation was finally passed for a new museum to be created. So on, on that point of... Um you know, increase in intentionality and in representing uh, Latinos nationally. Um, with the focus of this episode of, of our podcast being Hispanic Heritage Month, can you talk mm-hmm. a little bit about the history and the purpose of the month? Yeah, it, it's interesting because um, Hispanic Heritage Month, I'm from Miami. I, I grew up in Miami. I was born in New York. And Hispanic Heritage Month in South Florida is means something different uh, than Hispanic Heritage Month in, say, D.C. or another big city. Um, and it's because of the diversity of the culture, the people living there, um, and it's something that's celebrated every day, let's say. You know, the culture is celebrated every day. Um, but, you know, recognizing Hispanics and their achievements uh, during a period, during a certain month of the year, you know, started years ago to celebrate those those, those efforts and the legacies uh, that were being created. Um, but I look at it a different way here at the Smithsonian, you know, and, and I think that's something that once we build this museum, we finish building the muse- museum, uh, it'll be easier. It'll be much easier to accept that um, these are uh, efforts and legacies and and traditions that should be celebrated, you know, every day, every month, not just one month. Uh, you know, as as well intentioned as that is. It, it should be integrated into everything we do every day, and, 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 and the, the fuller American history narrative should include uh, Latino history. So that, that, that's really important for us to get that across. Absolutely. So picking up on that thread, actually, quoting the press release that announced you as director earlier this year, you stated in part that this museum will celebrate Latino accomplishments and resiliency through powerful stories that capture the adversity faced over centuries by Latinos in the U.S., and their perseverance to move forward and create a legacy, end quote. So without picking favorites, can you p- perhaps share a story or two of key events or figures throughout American history that particularly resonate with you? There, there's some that are, that are more well-known, like you know, Cesar Chavez and labor unions and, and workforce and making sure equal rights for, for workers. Um, you know, you have some incredible stories on revolution and independence and Jose Maiti and, and, and some other key figures in, in, in Caribbean history. Um, but the ones that really resonate with me are are the everyday stories. The and when you go to the new gallery we have here at the National Museum of American History, we just opened a gallery in June, the Molina Family Latino Gallery, um, and there we bring up you know biographies and, and oral histories for everyday people and people who made a difference over the years. And there there is there are some common themes on uh, resiliency and, and struggles and. Uh, and making a difference and standing up for what you believe in. And that, that's that's been a common theme from hundreds of years in, in the United States with Latinos. But it's also about seeing the stories of, of the of perseverance, you know, that, you know, that for generations uh, establishing themselves, uh, making sure that generations, you know, to come uh, have uh, have a say. And, and that, that's something that I, I noticed growing up, let's say, in South Florida, um, it, you know the, the family unit how important it is it was really about making sure that you know our kids and our grandkids had certain rights and they had certain privileges that, that, just like everybody else and i think that's what resonates me you when you walk through the exhibition and then you there's some things that really people really resonate with when they visit the gallery and that's uh the commonalities the things the shared experiences that we all have as a culture, but really outside of the Latino culture also. And some of those come through with music and art. You know, we have this amazing Celia Cruz dress and display with a Cuban flag embroidered on it. And uh, and it's so iconic because it doesn't matter if you're Cuban like Celia or you're from Venezuela, or Colombia or Mexico. She was an iconic salsa you know, singer and 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 a person that, that, that was well, that every, everyone knew across so many different Latin American countries in the Caribbean. And then brought us together. You know, those, those shared commonalities, I think, are the strongest stories that, that are in the exhibition. Yeah, our team was just talking about when we're going to stroll over to the Molina Family Latino Gallery. And in considering your background and your extensive experience in developing and working uh, in 
building museums and telling those stories. Can you talk about how you determine which artifacts you want to include, how to display them, and organizing the exhibits? I don't know if you can do that in a nutshell, but... Sure. No, I'll give you a quick overview. So the great thing is we have, you know, we have a scholarly advisory committee that, that we put together that's going to help us, uh, you know, look into different themes and topics uh, over the next few years. And then that this, this gallery that we have open now, we're going to rotate to two or three different shows over the next 10 years to try different things out see what the themes and topics are that people do want to see and resonate. Um, and then we'll start our collecting efforts, right? And finding those objects and artifacts across the United States that can help tell that story as we start developing it uh, with others. Uh, but I think it's important to point out that I want to make sure uh, as we do develop that story, that's just not the Smithsonian or us saying what's going to be. I mean, I want to make sure that we, we're going to reach out to different communities across the U.S., to make sure we we capture those those experiences and those stories, and we started doing that already. We we visited a few in you know, San Antonio, LA. I was in Denver last week. Uh, back in Miami, then we're going to Atlanta, and then we'll we'll also go across the Midwest and other places in the Northeast, the smaller communities, because we want to make sure that we don't create a void or this big uh, suction. The Smithsonian is going to come in and and capture all these stories and take those artifacts and the patrimony and and put it in display in, in, in D.C. No, we want to make sure that we collaborate and we work with many museums and community centers across the U.S. to to see how we can collaborate and maybe co-collect and co-steward some of these pieces that are their treasures and to make sure that we, we, we provide a space for them to be on display, but at the same time support their efforts to amplify their stories because those local stories are really the ones that become the national stories then. And uh, so that's going to be our our main task over the next 10 years. So with the the bulk of our audience for our podcast being uh, classroom teachers across the country and uh, and thinking about what you mentioned earlier, that Hispanic Heritage Month may have a different meaning, a different focus in each of these local communities, and with what you just mentioned, that um, you have had these opportunities to travel across the country to hear from different groups and organizations about what might or should be included in in the uh, new museum and and future exhibits. Um, Kind of in a nutshell, what should teachers ensure that they do incorporate in their classrooms in celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month? And what resources do you know that exist that could help them reach this goal? I think the most important thing to to share with with students and to bring out is the importance of, of their personal history and how relevant that is to the larger narrative. Uh, and that sometimes that's lost uh, growing up. I know it was with me uh, going to public school and as a young Hispanic um, kid of Cuban immigrant parents and growing up in South Florida, I had very little interest in Civil War history or the American Revolution because I just didn't know enough about it. I wasn't spoken to about at home. Uh, but there's ways to connect those things, you know, about fighting for independence and and, and many, many topics in American history that could tie into to their personal history and tie into a larger narrative. But talking about, speaking with, with, with students about what they've learned at home and their family legacies and generations before them and, and the values it's instilled in, in their upbringing. And, and just, I, I would challenge them to go back and, and interview their parents and their grandparents and, and, and record their you know, genealogy, do some genealogy work, do some... Uh, oral histories with, with your family and, and record those conversations and they're going to start to uncover so many details that didn't they weren't aware of and by by initiating those conversations your family members will then become excited about the opportunity to share these stories these uh, narratives with the younger younger people in their family and that that back and forth that connection is, is so is so important and, and that's how oral histories are, are shared for hundreds of years but if you can record them, it's not only going to help you know the students in, in their future and then when they, when they have a family and they can share their ancestry. It's also going to record important narratives and tor- important stories that go back hundreds of years that are that are not maybe very well known. And then you'll start uh, raising awareness and you start uh, you start feeling important. You'll start seeing how your story is important and it's not something to be neglected, even if it might not be taught in the classroom. So again, building that sense of pride and where they come from and what they have to share is very important. With the opening of the National Museum of the American Latino, um, and for those teachers who might not ever be able to get to the mall with their students, are there virtual learning opportunities or other resources that the Smithsonian has? 
We do. You know, the, our, we have a website for the museum, and there's many learning resources on there and lesson plans and many ways to engage. We provide all our resources and make them available to the public for free. So that's very encouraging. And we also have, at at our gallery, we also have a learning lab, a learning lounge, where we could also do lessons there and stream them to the classrooms and uh, broadcast our lessons. So that's another opportunity to engage with us. So all the materials that we we develop over the next few years, uh, when we do different exhibits and explore different topics and do different research on these topics, uh, we'll we'll be able to share them with with teachers. That's fantastic. Director Zamanillo, we really appreciate your time today, and uh, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Craig, Zach, and I found our conversation with Director Zamanillo to be inspiring, informative, and reflective, and we hope it was for you, too. We were inspired to learn more about the Latino and Latina experience through stories, informed on the creation and development of the new museum, and reflective of our own teaching practices, particularly with the approach to teaching this month. He spoke about themes, themes that reflect the struggles among the Latino community, their perseverance, their courage in standing up for what they believe in, and the significance of the family unit. These qualities are reflected in the contributions and accomplishments Latinos have made throughout history and continue to make in so many areas, from public service and activism to arts, literature, science, sports, and so much more. So it's through that lens that teachers can have students learn about figures in history, note those qualities, and generate connections. Director Samanillo talked about the commonalities and shared experiences we can have through music and art. And maybe we can weave a little history into it, too. And what came to mind for our team was Lin-Manuel Miranda's Broadway musical, Hamilton. Let's play a portion of a clip from a ceremony at which Lin-Manuel Miranda was presented with the Freedom Award by the United States Capitol Historical Society. Through humanities and arts programs, I learned more than how to play piano and follow stage directions. I learned to be a leader. I learned how to love collaborating. I nurtured the gift of empathy that really makes art transformational. When you're a theater kid, you make friends from different grades and social groups. You learn to work hard to create something greater than the sum of your parts. And just for the sake of making something great, you learn to trust your passion and let it lead the way. Without humanities and arts programs, I wouldn't be standing here. And without Alexander Hamilton and the countless other immigrants who built this country, it's very probable that very few of us would be here either. Our story, our story also includes the hundreds of thousands of young people today who came to this country with their parents and know no other home. Their parents have no documents, but their kids are getting college degrees, working as first responders during disasters like Harvey and Irma. And yes, in the case of my own congressman, Adriano Espaillat, some are even as working as lawmakers in the United States Congress. Our heritage of humanities and arts is shared and it's irreplaceable. He echoes the director's thoughts as he talks about shared experiences, the ability to connect, and the opportunities for and contributions of Latinos in the country. As former teachers, we value Lin-Manuel's reflection on his own education and how much he learned so much more than the content and skills in his humanities and arts programs. He mentioned qualities such as leadership, collaboration, and empathy that he could contribute to projects and to the community as well. And uh, director the Zamanillo also stressed the importance of stories and how we can connect through them. Next, we're highlighting Chilean-American author Isabel Allende, who describes her body of work as entertaining and educating readers by interweaving imaginative stories with significant historical events. Her own personal story is fascinating. As an extended family member of former Chilean President Salvador Allende, who was overthrown in a military coup in the early 70s, Isabel and her family were exiled from Chile to Venezuela. Some years later, when she discovered her grandfather was dying back in Chile, still living in exile and unable to visit him, she began to write him a letter. And that letter she later developed into her first novel, The House of the Spirits. That novel helped to launch her career as an international author. And over a career that has spanned more than two dozen works, her collection of stories are renowned for reflecting themes of oppression, family, love, and redemption. In the 1980s, she moved to California. And in 1992, she became a naturalized American citizen. In this short clip from the 2018 National Book Awards, where she was awarded the Medal for Distinguished Contribution to American Letters, 
Isabel talks about the significance and power of storytelling. Let's listen. And to bring people together, I believe in the power of stories. If we listen to another person's story, if we tell our own story, we start to heal from division and hatred because we realize that the similarities that bring us together are many more than the differences that separate us. I also write to understand what is writing after all but an attempt to sort out the confusion of life. Often I don't know why I feel compelled to write a certain story and it is only later that I find out that it is connected to some part of my life or my psyche that I needed to understand and sometimes to heal. For those without roots in a place, memory is essential to maintain a sense of continuity. Nobody witnesses the length of our lives. We need to remember. So that's a short clip, but there's a couple of significant things to unpack with students here. I'm paraphrasing, but she makes a salient point about how stories of personal struggle and exposing ourselves to differing perspectives can help us to find commonalities and heal division. And she also makes another uh, point that resonated with the three of us as big proponents of what we can all learn from oral histories, as she mentioned, uh, importance of documenting significant events and one's own life experiences to capture our own personal perspectives on history. Speaking of capturing those large historical events, Craig, we recently hosted an episode on the 65th anniversary of the Little Rock Nine and the integration of Little Rock Central High School, which is still available at cspan.org. In the episode, we talked with a National Park Service ranger and explored the story of how nine black students were denied entrance to their local high school and how this historical episode was related to the landmark Supreme Court case, Brown v. Board of Education. As Craig, Pam, and I prepare for each episode, and as we get to talk with historical and civic leaders, much like we did for our episode today, we discover new information, people, facts, events, and personal stories, things that might not be in your local social studies textbook. We learn along with you. And one significant story we discovered after talking with Director Zamanillo is that of the Mendez family of Orange County, California. While I'd estimate that the majority of our listeners have heard about or studied Brown v. Board, one of the circuit court cases that eventually led to the landmark decision involved the Mendez family in the 1947 case Mendez v. Westminster. As we'll hear from President Barack Obama, this case, quote, paved the way. For Sylvia Mendez, a lifelong quest for equality began when she was just eight years old. Outraged that their daughter had to attend a segregated school, Sylvia's parents linked arms with other Latino families to fight injustice in a California federal court, a case that would pave the way for Brown versus Board of Education. The next year, when a classmate taunted Sylvia saying that Mexicans didn't belong there, she went home in tears begging to leave the school. Her mother wouldn't have it. She told Sylvia, don't you realize that's why we went to court? You're just as good as he is. And Sylvia took those words to heart. And ever since, she has made it her mission to spread a message of tolerance and opportunity to children of all backgrounds and all walks of life. This clip, part of the ceremony from when Sylvia Mendez was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, highlights the personal impact of the case on her life. Mind you, as an eight-year-old child, and how it crafted her future as an advocate for, quote, tolerance and opportunity. Director Zamanillo talked at length about family stories and the impact of familial bonds. To borrow Sylvia's words directly, when asked what her parents taught her, quote, that we are all individuals, that we are all human beings, that we are all connected together, and that we all have the same rights, the same freedom. Mendez v. Westminster was indeed one monumental step forward in building the same freedom for all. While the case was pending before the Ninth Circuit, several organizations, including the NAACP, filed amicus briefs, one of which was written by future Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. And, two months after the case decision was announced, then-Governor of California Earl Warren signed a bill that ended school segregation in the state making it the first in the country to officially desegregate its public schools. But wait. Five years later, Thurgood Marshall would use similar reasoning from his amicus brief in Mendez for his argument during the 1954 Brown v. Board of Education case. 
a case in which the unanimous decision was written by none other than Chief Justice Earl Warren. Storytelling and story sharing are critical to understanding our past, to making connections between people, places, and events, and to better analyzing our present and planning for our future. Your students can engage in the action with our new lesson, an oral history's how-to, in which they interview a family member or family friend and share their findings with the class. We'll link to that lesson on our featured resources podcast page, available at www.cspan.org forward slash classroom. And as we approach the end of this episode, we want to highlight another person who embodies the themes that we've been talking about. Overcoming challenges, perseverance, making a difference, standing up for what you believe in, and the significance of family. And that is Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor, the first Latina to serve on the Supreme Court, who was raised in the Bronx, New York, by her mother after her father passed away when she was young, had a close relationship with her grandmother, excelled in her education, rose in her legal career, was nominated by President George H.W. Bush and served in the U.S. District Court of New York, and finally was nominated to be Associate Justice of the Supreme Court by President Obama, where she currently serves. Justice Sotomayor has committed her life to public service, but is also a writer who has impacted young people across the country through her books. C-SPAN's Book TV team had the opportunity to interview her at the Miami Book Fair in 2018. Our team reached out to students across the country to get questions they wanted to ask her. Let's listen to her response to one of those questions in this clip. What is one thing that you are most proud of being the first Latina on the Supreme Court? Oh, you know, no one's asked me that question. (laughs) How interesting. What am I most proud of? I think what I'm most proud of in my life was reflected the day I was sworn in to the Supreme Court in my public ceremony. I was in the court's um, courtroom, which is quite beautiful. And I was sitting um, facing the court until they call you up to be sworn in. You sit in the seat sat in by Don Marshall, who is one of the most influential justices of the Supreme Court one of the earliest justices. At any rate, as I was sitting there, I was looking at my mom and I was looking at my entire family and most of my lifelong friends. They had come from around the world, literally. My entire family had come from Puerto Rico. And in that moment, I realized that no matter how successful you are, It's really only meaningful if your family and friends come with you. If they share your life with you, then that is success. I think that reflects all of the themes that we've been highlighting in this episode. And we have several resources that feature Justice Sotomayor sharing important moments in her life. And we'll be sure to post them on our website along with this podcast. So be sure to check them out. Once again, we'd like to thank Jorge Zamanillo, founding director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Latino, for his time and for his candid stories that he shared with us. As he said, and as we have heard throughout the many resources that we've shared throughout this episode, the stories of the people in our local communities are paramount, and we are responsible for collecting them. As Chilean poet Alejandro Zambra wrote in his novel, Ways of Going Home, quote, I knew little. But at least I knew that no one could speak for someone else. That although we might want to tell other people's stories, we always end up telling our own. For those of you who are within driving distance of our nation's capital, we strongly encourage you to stop by the National Museum of American History on the National Mall to check out the Presente Gallery, the first physical space of the new Latino Museum, which is slated to open within the next few years. And for those of you who are a bit further away, please make sure to visit latino.si.edu to take your students on a virtual tour of the gallery and explore the many stories that are on display. 
And once again, you'll find all of the video-based resources that we've discussed in this episode posted in the podcast section of our featured resources page, which you can find at cspan.org slash classroom. For timely updates on all of the content we develop, be sure to follow us on Twitter and Facebook at C-SPAN Classroom. And if you would ever like to connect with our team to learn more about what we have to offer for teachers and students, please email us anytime at educate at cspan.org. That's it for this week. Join us next time as we feature Student Cam, C-SPAN's annual video documentary competition for students in grades 6 through 12. We'll talk about the requirements, offer some tips and tricks for students and teachers, and the $100,000 that we award in cash prizes. And as we sign off, we'll play a song featuring the cast with the Broadway musical Hamilton. Until then, thank you for joining us. Theodosia, what to say to you? You have my eyes, you have your mother's name. When you came into the world, you cried, and it broke my heart. I'm dedicating every day to you. Domestic life was never quite my style when you smile. You knocked me out, I fall apart And I thought I was so smart You will come of age with our young nation We'll bleed and fight for you We'll make it right for you If we lay a strong enough foundation We'll pass it on to you We'll give the world to you And you'll blow us all away Someday, someday more inside me now Oh Philip you outshine the morning sun My son When you smile I fall apart And I thought I was so smart My father wasn't around My father wasn't around I swear that I'll be around Safe and sound for you. We'll come of age with our young nation. We'll bleed and fight for you. We'll make it right for you. If we lay a strong enough foundation, we'll pass it on to you. 